welcome everybody. This is our first meeting of Stanley Reads, and we're going to be talking about the first two chapters of Homegoing, Afia and Essie. Um, I'm going to get started by talking about some works in our collection, and then we'll move into smaller group discussions. And after each one, we'll come back and kind of debrief and share our thoughts. Um, so at any point, if you have questions, feel free to speak up or put those in the chat. And I'll get started um, by going through some of the works that relate to the themes and um, the locations that we hear about in our first two chapters. So I'm starting with this map of Ghana just to sort of locate us. Um, so you have the larger map of Africa in the upper um, right corner there. And so you can see Ghana's on the western coast um, of Africa just kind of as the continent is curving in. We have the Cape Coast here highlighted with this yellow circle. And that's one of the key places that we hear about um, in these first two chapters, the Cape Coast Castle. And so that's right there, um, kind of in the middle of the coast of Ghana. And to kind of locate this, we hear about two different ethnic groups, the Asante and the Fante. Um, so the Fante are along the coast and the Asante are a little bit more um, inland from the ocean. So this is a map of Ghana around 1700. So around the time that our story is taking place. And so you get a sense, the Asante lands uh, grow during the 17th and 18th, uh, the 1700s and the 1800s. And so this expands, but this is sort of roughly what the lands were like um, in the mid um, 18th century when we start the story. I'm starting, since we start with Afia and she's Fante, I'm starting with a couple of works from the Fante group. Um, this is an Asafo flag. Um, so this was much later than when our story takes place. This is um, from before 19, uh, 1947, um, but this is a 20th century artist. Um, so we're looking about 200 years after the beginning of the story. But these were flags that have been popular um, with the Fante uh, since for the last 400 years or so. So after the Portuguese uh, came to Ghana, the people there saw the flags and they adopted that format um, to discuss and kind of um, promote the qualities of their different um, military groups. And so in this one, we see the central figure with this very large object that he's holding up that represents the globe. Um, and what I was really drawn to in this flag is the weapons. So they're gold um, hilted weapons that we see. And in that first chapter, um, Kabe gets the gold hilted machete from Abiku um, during that first meeting where all the warriors, all the men come together and they're starting to um, make, discuss this alliance with the Asante group where they're going to help sell and enslave people to the British. And this one, we have number one, N-O, and then one here. It's reversed, but this just gives the, um, kind of promotes and gives the number, identifies the group. Um, these originated as kind of military groups, but now they're more social groups um, and kind of community groups. The next uh, work that we have is a mudfish. So this is um, identified as a con. So the Akan peoples are um, composed of both the Asante and the Fante. Um, and so we're not sure exactly where, uh, which group this started with, but we just know that it's a con. Um, the mudfish is symbolic of being able to overcome um, really horrible conditions and being very resilient. The mudfish can survive in a really um, unbearable kind of conditions. And so this is sort of a symbol of resilience. And I think that this is both applicable to Afia and Essie um, as we kind of hear their trials that they begin to face. The next, we're kind of shifting um, to Asante. This is a Kua Ba. This is a kind of doll um, related to fertility. And so a woman, um, the traditional story is there's a woman named Akua who can't 
conceive a child. And so she goes to a diviner um, who tells her to commission a carved wooden figure and carry it around um, in her wrapper as if it were a baby and also um, kind of treat it as a surrogate child. Uh, these figures became really popular. Um, you'll see them carried um, passed through families, uh, but you also see them as popular tourist objects in the 20th century. So um, if you're a fan of the show Will and Grace, we see this on the mantle um, in that television show. The ones that are made for tourists tend to be more painted and have uh, a lot of beads added to them. You'll also see individual legs um, carved out. This is a, a more traditional form of it. So we see female ideals of beauty being conveyed. So the large round forehead um, and the rings around the neck to symbolize um, kind of rings of fat and the idea that that helps with fertility and carrying a child. These akua ba are generally female. So they represent female ideals of beauty. And the Akan society is matrilineal. So power passes through the female lineage. And the female children were also desirable because they would have helped around the household. Um, and I think this is a, a key object in terms of Mambe because she gives birth to Athea and then has to leave her and escape, sets a fire and escapes into the woods. And then when she has Essie, her daughter becomes this um, really important, almost extension of herself. They're always together. Um, they're never really separated. Essie is loved by her mother and her father um, to the point of being spoiled. They, they talk about her being um, like a ripe mango, just the side of being sweet. Yeah, yeah, thanks um, for pointing that out. The rings of fat, um, are also um, visible on other um, forms throughout West African art and West African cultures. Um, here we see another example. So we see the rings of fat also on this um, comb. So dua afe, dua means wooden and afe is comb. So this is a wooden comb um, that would have been used for um, creating um, hairstyles of braids and coils, and we see some really elaborate um, coils in the Asante culture. Um, and again, this is, um, the combs are associated with female beauty ideals, and we see some of those similar features on this comb. Um, so you see also the same kind of face um, coming through with the eyebrows, coming down to the nose and the rings of fat. And then the last object from our collection that I brought in is the kente cloth. This is um, mentioned in the story at the beginning of chapter she with Essie when Essie asked Tansi to tell her a story. Um, and Tansi tells the story of Anansi um, at the beginning of kente cloth. So two warriors, two brothers are in the forest and they see the spider web and they're amazed by the beauty of it and they think they can recreate that um, in weaving. So the traditional, um, the first kente cloths were black and white. Um, the materials came from the raffia tree and, and those were the colors that uh, came from it. Later, they started to dye um, the fibers to get these different colors. So within this, there's a lot of symbolism within the kente cloths. The black color represents Africa. The red is the blood of ancestors. Green represents the forest and gold represents gold. Um, within the weaving, there's lots of different messages that can be conveyed. Um, and depending on how the patterns are put together, you can have more complex messages. But um, some of the most popular messages um, are uh, God is great and never give up. And so these kente cloths, they're um, woven by men and they're also worn by men. So these are reserved for the wealthy um, and the, those with the highest status within the community traditionally.